Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mary Ann the president of World Boston, and it is wonderful uh, to have you with us, whether you are with us here in person or on Zoom for chat and chatter. Uh, thanks, uh, first of all, to our host, uh, James Bellis, and our friends at uh, Fuller and Lardner for their very kind hospitality. Uh, we are very honored uh, to welcome Ambassador Martin Indyk, who will discuss his book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger, and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. So for the sake of time, I will abbreviate Ambassador Indyk's uh, prolific bio. Uh, briefly, he is uh, currently a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Israel from 1995 to 97, and again from 2000 to 2001. Earlier, he was special assistant to President Bill Clinton and senior director in your East and South Asian affairs at the National Security Council, um, and then as assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern affairs. In addition, Ambassador Indek was U.S. special envoy uh, for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations in 2013 and 2014. Uh, Ambassador Indek, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Let's jump right in. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be uh, with you this evening at World Boston, here in Boston. I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to talk about my book. Uh, you might wonder why the world needs another book on Henry Kissinger. Um, they seem to come out on average to a year. And then there are his own books. And he's just finished another one at the age of 99. Uh, which I think will be over the next few months. Uh, but uh, there actually has never been a book written on Henry Kissinger's Middle East diplomacy. Um, and that's quite surprising because although these days he's remembered for the far more controversial things uh, he did, whether it was Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Chile, Bangladesh, uh, etc. And of course, his um, opening to China that he did with President Nixon and, and the detente of the Soviet Union, arms control negotiations. But just about all of those things uh, were done while he was national security advisor in Nixon's first term. Uh, the the second four years of Kissinger's time in government was when he was Secretary of State uh, for Nixon, who was tied down, dragged down by his Watergate was, and then for President Gerald Ford. And, and in those four years as Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger basically devoted most of his time to uh, trying to promote peace in the Middle East. And he was amazingly successful at it. I uh, became quite a celebrity for it in those days. He appeared on the cover of Time magazine four times in, in 1974. Um, in Newsweek cover, he was uh, Super Henry with a super, uh, Superman uh, uniform and, and H on his chest. Um, and his success related to the two agreements that he negotiated between Israel and Egypt, and one between Israel and Syria, which effectively took Egypt out of the conflict with Israel, legitimized that move with the Israel-Syria deal, um, laid the foundations for the American-led peace process, and for American dominance um, in the Middle East uh, from that point on. and and. Uh, in the process, uh, he was able to stabilize uh, a very volatile region um, by uh, essentially ending the state-to-state -state conflict between Israel and its Arab neighbors, and uh, at the same time uh, solidifying a, uh, an agreement between Israel and Syria, which has essentially kept the peace on the Golan Heights uh, for the last you know, 40 years or so. Uh, so that's essentially why I decided to write this book, um, because there was, first of all, a gap 
in, in the study of Kissinger that I was able to uh, do a deep dive into the archives for because Kissinger is a man of history and a student of history, documented every conversation he had while he was in government and every negotiation. And it's all there, 95% of it has been declassified. Um, and I also had the opportunity to interview him at length, uh, every chapter basically I discussed with him. Uh, and I try to illuminate the story with my own experiences um, as, as somebody who was engaged in the effort to make peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors, Israel and the Palestinians, first of all in the Clinton administration when I was part of Bill Clinton's peace team and then in the Obama administration when I was the special envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations under Secretary of State Kerry and President Obama. At the end of that last effort, uh, which ended in, in failure and effectively ended the Israeli-Palestinian um, negotiating process. We haven't had a negotiation between Israel and the Palestinians since then. That was back in 2014. We haven't had an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians since 1998. Uh, and so because four presidents have essentially tried and failed to resolve this conflict. And I was involved in the last effort overseeing it. I decided that it was time to try to understand what had gone wrong with American diplomacy. It's easy enough to blame both sides, but I came to the conclusion after that effort that there was something fundamentally wrong about the way that we were approaching it. And this was not just Obama, but Trump after him and, and, and uh, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush before him. Uh, so that's why I decided to go back to where it all began with Henry Kissinger and try to understand from that uh, deep dive into history, uh, how to and how not to uh, make peace in the Middle East. As you can see, I started out expecting to be writing a book about uh, Kissinger's peacemaking diplomacy. Um, and that's essentially what I thought I was doing. But at certain points, as I went through the protocols of all of his negotiations with Israeli and Arab leaders, from Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt, to Golda Meir and, and Yitzhak Rabin and Moshe Dayan of, of Israel and Hafez al-Assad of Syria and King Hussein of Jordan and King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's sort of something that seemed quite strange, that every time one of these leaders would talk to Kissinger about how they were ready to take the big step, how they were ready to end the conflict, make peace, how their people were ready for peace, Kissinger would always back them off and say, you know, we shouldn't go there. That's uh, too risky. Uh, that's not achievable. Uh, we need to go for something that's more tangible and concrete and, and security arrangements. And um, so it was clear that he was very reluctant to uh, pursue peace, even though his Arab and Israeli interlocutors seemed seem to be keen to do so. And, and of course, the ultimate proof of this is that two years after he left office, Jimmy Carter made peace between Israel and Egypt. Uh, so it was clear, it was clear from the documents that I was reading, it was clear from, from the history of what happened afterwards, that they were ready. And yet uh, Kissinger wasn't. And so I'm trying to understand what was going on here, because he doesn't write about it himself. He's written 4,000 pages in his memoirs, and he doesn't explain this at all there. Um, I went back and read uh, what he had written uh, about 
as a, as a student of history of international relations. And the first book he wrote was about the establishment of order in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars in early 19th century Europe. Those wars had caused vast devastation across Europe. And uh, the great powers came together uh, to establish an order. And the architects of that order were, were the two foreign ministers of Austria and, and Great Britain. And uh, his first book, which was his PhD thesis, was titled A World Restored, Metternich, Castlereagh, and the Problems of Peace. There it was in the title, The Problems of Peace. Henry Kissinger saw peace as problematic. And on the first page, he writes about the paradox of peace, that peace pursued with too much energy and too much passion as uh, leaders of great powers are wont to do. And he was particularly wary of American leaders, uh, seeing them as, as more prone than others because of the immense power of the United States as superpower. Uh, and this sense of divine providence that American statesmen have, that it's their responsibility to change the world, to make it a better place, to make it more free, more peaceful, more democratic. Um, Kissinger was deeply suspicious of those urges, as were Castlereagh and Metternich. Um, and in, instead of peace, which the paradox of peace for him was that if it's pursued with too much zeal, it would produce the opposite, that is to say, war. And of course, Kissinger was much affected by his own experience as, as a teenager uh, fleeing uh, Nazi rule in Germany, uh, coming to this country with his family, 13 of his immediate family were murdered by the Nazis. Um, and, and so fleeing from that chaos uh, and very much conscious of the way in which appeasement uh, had led to the Second World War and the efforts in Versailles after the uh, First World War peace treaty there had laid the foundation for the war that eventually came. But Kissinger's approach was focused not on pursuing peace, but rather establishing order. And it was order that he saw in his own life because of the chaos he'd experienced and order in international affairs. Because order based on a balance of power in favor of the status quo powers, those who sought to preserve the order, was the way in which uh, conflict could be reduced and the situation of stability could be promoted and maintained. And that would eventually lead to peace, but over a long period of time where if you could maintain the order, states in the system would eventually adjust to the point where they decided that they were exhausted by the conflict and would therefore be prepared to end the conflict and make peace. But he didn't expect this to happen in the short term. This was something that would take decades before the powers would exhaust themselves and make the peace. So when the 1973 Yom Kippur War broke out in, in the Middle East, Kissinger had been made Secretary of State, appointed Secretary of State a few weeks earlier, he took this model that he had studied and written about of 19th century Europe and applied it to the Middle East. One would think that it couldn't possibly work and yet it did. Uh, he knew very little about the Arab world. He never visited it, uh, even as national security advisor. He'd never written about the Ottoman Empire, even though his expertise was on 19th century European order. Uh, 
But here he took this model of how to promote order and applied it. And in the application, he developed the diplomacy that he labeled step-by-step -step diplomacy. Uh, rather than try, as certainly Nixon, Ford, Brezhnev, the head of the Soviet Union at the time, all wanted, which was to jump to a final agreement that would end the conflict. Kissinger wanted to approach it step by step, incrementally, uh, so that uh, instead of aiming for peace treaties, Kissinger was aiming for interim agreements that would stabilize the situation, separate the armies, create buffer zones and uh, security arrangements, and elements of peace, like non-belligerency commitments, but not that he, he resisted any attempt to actually achieve peace treaties. And so it was this incremental uh, approach, conservative, cautious, uh, and focused on order before peace. That was the hallmark of Kissinger's approach to resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. And, you know, in the last conversation I had with him about this book, I asked him whether he regretted not making that peace between Israel and Egypt. I said, you know, it was clear that, that Saddam was ready and the Israelis were ready. And he said, no. He said he didn't regret it. Had he been a private sector of state again if Gerald Ford had won the election instead of Jimmy Carter, he would have pursued a non-belligerency agreement between Israel and Egypt rather than a peace treaty. And I said, why? He said, because I always feared that if I pushed it too hard, I would break it. And that was for me a light bulb moment, you know, I was like, yeah. Because at Camp David in 2000, Bill Clinton and Ehud Barak, the Prime Minister of Israel, tried to do what Kissinger warned against, end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Ehud Barak insisted that Clinton bring Arafat to a summit that would try to resolve all of the issues and reach an end of claims, end of conflict agreement. Arafat did not want to go. Uh, he resisted mightily. Clinton insisted uh, and uh, dragged him to Camp David. Uh, Arafat was not ready to end the conflict. Uh, he looked for a way out. Uh, we can go into the details of that if you're interested, but the fact is, that the effort at Camp David failed uh, and it laid the foundations for a few months later, the outbreak of the Intifada, the uprising, which then consumed the whole uh, edifice of peacemaking that we had struggled so hard to uh, construct in the previous eight years in, in a paroxysm of violence that killed thousands of people on both sides and destroyed all the trust between Israelis and Palestinians to the point where ever since, that was year 2000, 22 years later, it's like Humpty Dumpty. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Notwithstanding the efforts of four presidents to try to resolve the conflict four presidents tried and failed. And so that is the lesson that I brought away, the main lesson, there are lots of others, but the main lesson brought away from this effort to understand what Kissinger uh, was up to in his successful uh, attempts to lay the foundations for a stable order that would eventually lead to peace. Um, it was an incremental step-by-step -step approach that, that 
was less likely to achieve ultimate agreements, but more likely to avoid the conflict that we managed to bring on by zealous pursuit of peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I want to take the opportunity to ask the first question. Um, and, and that is, and, and what we've been reading and hearing about uh, the step-by-step -step process and monitoring our goals are very, very applicable um, to gnarly, complicated conflicts. Immediately, of course, I think about Ukraine. Many of us are thinking about Ukraine kind of all day and all night. So uh, this begs the question of what Kissinger would say about Ukraine. I think he actually did write a, an op-ed. Um, but what would he say about Ukraine? And, and would this step-by-step -step process apply? Thank you. Well, um, he, uh, he wrote an op-ed in 2014 ah, yes. uh, <laughs> after uh, Putin's annexation of Crimea. But he hasn't written anything since. And that's because he's been preoccupied with this last book that he's just finished, uh, which is a pantheon of world leaders that he has known. Uh, and so uh, as I go around uh, the country talking about my book, it's almost inevitable that this question of what would Kissinger do about Ukraine comes up. So eventually I decided, well, Instead of speculating, I'd call him up and ask him, which is what I did. So I can report to you <laughs> what, what uh, Kissinger thinks about this. First of all, uh, he, uh, in, he, he says, he's always very careful in public to, not to criticize uh, the government because he still wants to play a role in advising them. But, but he thinks that uh, uh, NATO should have been taken off the table for Ukraine before uh, before the war started, um, and that in its aftermath, uh, Ukrainian independence has to be achieved and guaranteed. Um, but Ukraine should should serve as a buffer state between uh, Russia and NATO, and should not be must not be part of either. Russia or, or uh, NATO. Uh, he's all in favor of it being part of the EU. Uh, but he, he's, he's most taken, and this is the way Kissinger thinks about the world in terms of power and balance of power. What he's most taken with is what he regards as, as Russia's defeat. He says Russia has already lost this war. Um, the inability of this superpower to get its way with a small neighbor um, is uh, profoundly important in terms of his view of the balance of power. That uh, if Russia can't defeat one small country, how's it going to defeat uh, NATO? How's it going to even stand up to NATO? Um, and so, therefore, um, he feels that Ukraine's independence will be secured, especially as a result of their determination to fight. Um, the fact that they're fighting on their own homeland territory um, and the fact that they have such massive support from uh, the West and the United States in, in particular. Um, but he thinks that over time, the danger is going to be not for Ukraine's independence, but rather for Russia's uh, integrity. He can foresee that, that Russia could well, being such a vast power with centralized control, um, to being destabilized as a result of this, the results of these wars and, and Russia's loss, that Russia will eventually kind of disintegrate. Um, and that will provide an opportunity for China, very different to the one that everybody else is focused on now uh, in the East. Um, and to achieve some, some of its territorial aspirations uh, in the East. And that that will 
end up destabilizing the situation. In the meantime, you know, he believes in the Kissingerian principle and in a three-way tripolar system between the United States, Russia, and China. Uh, the United States has to be friendlier to both than they are to each other. There's a basic principle that he developed with the time of the Soviet Union and then the opening to China, and he thinks that it's important that the United States find a way to separate China uh, from Russia in these circumstances. And he believes that if he's right about what's going to happen to Russia, that China will do that um, anyway, and we should be out there seeking to encourage it. Okay. Um all right, so we're going to go to questions. I apologize ahead of time. Um, you may wonder what I'm doing with my phone in the middle of a program. And uh, we're working out hybrid life. It's how Natalie, who's back there, and I are communicating. Uh, so um, we have a question from our wonderful host here at Foley and Lardner, James Duvalis. So James, go right ahead. Okay, you go. thank you. Uh, I even wrote it down. Uh, Ambassador Indyke, thank you for your time this evening. That was a fascinating insight, and I do look forward to reading your book. It is a privilege to have you here this evening. Thank you. Uh, I have two succinct questions that I'll ask a, a, in succession here. Uh, to me, they are difficult and sensitive questions. Uh, you have dealt with difficult and sensitive questions for a career, so please understand that I ask these questions with politeness and genuine intellectual curiosity. Go for it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Secretary Kissinger had many accomplishments. Uh, it has also been credibly reported that Secretary Kissinger sabotaged peace talks to end the Vietnam War for the purpose of helping President Nixon win the 1968 election. President Johnson later called this action, quote unquote, treason. This is the Chenault affair. Uh, undermining peace talks to help a preferred candidate win an election likely prolonged human misery, suffering, and death. Acute, including among American soldiers, all for our personal political uh, purposes. In view of this behavior and in consideration of his accomplishments, how should Secretary Kissinger be remembered? Number one. And number two, very quickly, uh, your Wikipedia page <laughs> for what that is worth, yeah, uh, that's <laughs> uh, quotes you as saying, quote, in the 21st century, the world will not keep tolerating the Israeli occupation. The occupation threatens Israel's status in the world, end quote. Given the brutality and the denial of human rights in the occupied territories, how can the United States and other developed democracies maintain a position of moral leadership and integrity without taking meaningful action against Israel in the form of effective consequential sanctions? Okay, so those are two uh, big questions. I'll deal with the first one shortly because uh, I was not uh, doing a study of um, Kissinger's uh, uh, involvement in the in Vietnam negotiations. Um, but uh, there's no doubt that he was informing the Nixon campaign of the uh, negotiations that were going on um, between the Johnson administration and, and the North Vietnamese. And uh, he had access to that information because he had been involved in in parts of that, that effort in himself as a kind of outside advisor to the Johnson administration. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, Nixon says in his own biography that, that Kissinger uh, uh, gave them information about the status of the negotiations. Um, so I think that much is established. What effect it had, you seem to think that destroyed the chances for peace. I think that's a vast exaggeration. Um, but uh, its uh, most immediate effect was not on the Vietnam negotiations, it was on Kissinger's credibility with Richard Nixon, which probably helped him get the job as National Security Advisor. Uh, but there was an instance that I write about in the book that I think is, is uh, important in terms of understanding the downside of Kissinger's cautious, incremental approach to conflict resolution. Uh, in February of, of 1973, 
Um, Kissinger was national security advisor at the time to Nixon. Uh, Anwar Sadat had kicked out Soviet military advisors, which Kissinger had called on him to do two years earlier. So that actually did a big surprise. And then he wanted to send his national security advisor to meet with Kissinger. Uh, and Kissinger stalled for about 10 months. Um, he, was, he was involved himself in the intensive negotiations with the Vietnamese for a peace treaty that was eventually um, uh, negotiated, agreed on um, a year later. But he kind of stalled. He, he basically wasn't much interested. Eventually, Sadat's national security advisor came um, to town, actually not to Washington. They had a secret meeting in Armonk, New York. And, and uh, there, uh, Hafez Ismail, the Sadat's national security advisor, laid out a far-reaching peace uh, offer initiative by Sadat. And Kissinger, uh, at first, he was kind of interested, fascinated by this. And he took it to Nixon, and the two of them were quite excited about it. But then they sat down, and Kissinger sat down to brief the then Israeli ambassador to Washington, whose name happened to be Yitzhak Rabin. And Rabin, in, in his typical way, when he wanted to dismiss something, he would go like this, you know, you can forget about it. And he said, there's nothing new here. And Kissinger got very defensive and said, well, it might not be new to you, but it's new to me. And Rabin said, no, there's nothing here. And then Golda Meir came to town as prime minister the next day. She said, there's nothing new. And Kissinger dropped it. And uh, had he pursued it, this is conjecture, this is a counterfactual, but had he pursued it, uh, it's possible that he might have headed off the war um, between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Syria that was so destructive of life on both sides and, and also led to the Arab oil embargo, which plunged the world into a global recession. So uh, that is, you know, I think the the downside of Kissinger's approach, which is that he's very careful not to overreach and to warn about the dangers of overreaching. There are several instances, if you follow the American pronouncements over the last few weeks during the Ukraine war, in which our tendency to overreach started to find expression. And our Secretary of Defense saying that our goal now is to weaken the Russian army so that it wouldn't, the Russian forces, so they wouldn't be able to do this again. Um, or uh, in the president's statement about Putin being a monster and needed to go, uh, where we start to creep in, mission creep into, in, into uh, you know, regime change with all of the problems that we faced with that in, in the past. So there's the danger of overreaching, but there's also the danger of underreach. And so uh, that's where I really think you know, we need to take into account the importance of kind of finding a middle way between too much zeal and too little. Now, as far as you know, you asked a question about Israel, I doubt that what's in, I mean, I don't read my Wikipedia page, but I doubt that that's an accurate quote. I think. What I believe is that um, the, uh, Israel needs to find a way to end its occupation uh, of the West Bank, not just for the sake of peace with the Palestinians, but more for the sake of its own future as a Jewish democratic state. And, and uh, that is a big challenge for Israel that uh, it has to find an answer to it because uh, if it maintains control over the Palestinians in the West Bank and indirectly over Palestinians in Gaza, you know, eventually it's going to find itself in a situation where um, Arabs are a majority in the land that Israel controls. And that is going to raise serious questions about 
whether Israel is going to remain a Jewish state or a democratic state. If it's a democratic state, in those circumstances, it won't be Jewish, a Jewish state. If it's a Jewish state, it won't be democratic. So it has a dilemma that it is going to have to deal with. And, um, you know, that's, that's a challenge that we can help Israel with. Um, but the Arab states that are normalizing their relations with Israel can help Israel with. But in the, in the end, it's the Israeli people and the Israeli government that's going to have to come to terms with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll go to Jim. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I'm curious in your description of the failure of the Camp David uh, efforts by uh, Barack and uh, Clinton, um, did you have conversations with uh, Secretary Kissinger, or has he written that he attribute the failure to overreach by American diplomacy, or would he agree with Clinton, who faulted Arafat for having walked away, having planned the terrorist regime of the Second Intifada? Or is that your interpretation of what Kissinger probably would have thought about it? Yeah, no, he doesn't. He's never opined on on uh, Camp David. Um, and uh, he, had, he doesn't know the details of, of what happened there. So he's not, you know, he's not an authority on it. I had an authority on it <laughs> since I was there. <laughs> so I can tell you. Um, but, um, I was, by the way, completely in on this idea of trying to resolve the conflict. Um, in fact, I had said to Clinton at the beginning of uh, his time in office when I was his Middle East advisor in the White House. But if he put his mind to it, uh, he could achieve four peace agreements in his first term um, and be done with the Arab Israeli conflict. Uh, why do I say that? Because the Soviet Union had just collapsed, the uh, Iraqi army had just been thrown out of Kuwait and defeated, um, all the Arabs were in negotiations, peace negotiations with Israel as a result of the Madrid uh, peace process. And it looked like all the stars were lined up for that kind of breakthrough. Um, and and uh, we knew not Kissinger. Partly the reason we knew not Kissinger is as I say, he never really explained his approach. We obfuscated it. There were all sorts of reasons uh, for that. Uh, but we, in, in our eagerness to end the conflict and our eagerness to support Iraq's effort to do so, uh, we essentially abandoned the Oslo process that Rabin had introduced. And it was Rabin, having been influenced by Kissinger, that introduced an, who introduced an incremental approach. If you know your Oslo agreements, you would know that it, it provided for three territorial withdrawal steps by Israel, three further redeployments. Uh, and there's nothing in Oslo about a Palestinian state, about Jerusalem, about refugees. That was all to be negotiated later. So Rabin's approach was an incremental approach. But after Rabin was assassinated, then Netanyahu won elections, and he was deeply reluctant to do any kind of next step. Uh, eventually, we dragged him to do a 13% withdrawal from, from the West Bank, and his government collapsed uh, as a result of that. And then came Barack, and Barack said, forget about all of that. Let's go and finish it. And we said, yeah, why not? You know, it's Clinton's last year. Let's go for it. We didn't uh, approach it with enough caution and, and skepticism. And we didn't listen to Arafat, uh, who didn't want to go. Um, and, and, you know, to say that he wasn't ready to resolve the conflict is kind of obvious now, but he was telling us, I can't do that. I can't make the compromises necessary for an end of conflict, end of claims agreement, either because he couldn't, felt he couldn't deliver or because he wasn't ready to end the conflict. Either way, 
it was a, a mistake to try to force him into it. And that's essentially what we did. We dragged him there, we put him in the corner, we made him a very generous offer, but he wasn't ready. So we ended with failure and the failure had, had fairly profound consequences. Was he planning the intifada? I don't think so. He's not, he's a ta tactician, he's not a strategist. But when the opportunity came along, he didn't stop it. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, now, uh, Charles is just going to read uh, one of our questions from uh, Zoom. Yes, uh, Mahdi Dia. He says, thank you, Ambassador Indic. My question is, how would the annexation of the Golan Heights impact any peacemaking in the Middle East? And what do you think stands as an obstacle to achieving internal peace in Syria? Uh, so this is a question that I can honestly say I haven't um, had in any of my many book talks. So I'm grateful for it. I'm partly grateful for it because uh, I myself spent a lot of time during the Clinton administration working on the peace deal that never came which was the Israeli-Syrian deal. And um, it really uh, has not been uh, written up in any great detail because it didn't happen. But the fact of the matter is that, that Yitzhak Rabin, as Prime Minister, when he came for his first meeting with Bill Clinton as president, he told Clinton he would withdraw in full from the Golan Heights in exchange for full peace from Syria with normalization and the appropriate security arrangements. And so Clinton had in his pocket a, uh, a commitment from Rabin that if his needs were met, uh, the territorial dimension of the conflict in Syria would not be a problem. And so we went off to try to uh, make the deal between Israel and Syria. And after eight years of, of effort, uh, in November of, of 2000, uh, Assad, who'd been playing around with us, even though he knew that the Israelis were prepared to withdraw fully from the Golan Heights, suddenly told us that he was ready and then he would send his foreign minister to Washington to negotiate directly with the Israeli prime minister um, and to make peace. And he, he uh, uh, then hosted the foreign minister of Syria and the prime minister of Israel, Ehud Barak, uh, in December of, of uh, 2000 in uh, Washington. And after that meeting, that preliminary meeting, uh, the foreign minister went to an iftar, it was Ramadan, with all of the Arab ambassadors who'd been assembled by the Saudi ambassador. And he told them where, tell your governments that my president has decided to make peace and we, we are going to make peace with Israel. Um, and I'll cut a long story short, but it is a, one of those kind of tragic elements of, of Arab-Israeli peacemaking. That when Sadat was ready, Barak was not. He didn't feel that he could make a commitment to full withdrawal from the Golan because he didn't feel his people were ready. Three months later, Barak made the commitment. Sorry, sorry. You said Sadat. Did I? I'm sorry get my Arab leaders mixed up. Assad was ready, Barak was not. Three months later, Barak was ready, but Assad was coming to the end of his life and um, decided that he didn't have time to make peace. He needed to put his energies into putting his son in power, Bashar al-Assad. And um, as a result of that, uh, when Clinton presented the map from Barak showing Israel's full withdrawal from the Golan, Assad said no. And that, that was the end of, of the effort that 
actually um, could have resulted in, in peace between Israel and Syria, which would have transformed the whole nature of, of, of the conflict. Um, people, Israelis often say how lucky they were that they didn't give up the Golan Heights. But I think that that misses the way in which that uh, would have dramatically transformed circumstances, including Arafat's circumstances, where instead of being in the catbird seat at Camp David, he would have found himself chasing after the peace train after Israel and Syria had made peace. And the interesting thing for me, when I went back and looked at the protocols of Kissinger's negotiations with Assad, was that Assad at that point also said his people were ready for peace and he was ready to make peace with Israel. And Kissinger didn't take it up either. So the history of the Israeli-Syrian negotiation, by the way, there's a new book out now by Fred Hoff, who was a negotiator on the Israel-Syria track in the Obama administration, the first term. Uh, and he tells the story about another effort that almost succeeded but broke down. So it's the piece that ne never quite got made. All right, we have time for just one. I'm, I'm sorry if that's static that I'm making, uh, but just one more question and then we're gonna go to book signing. So Barkev, um, we're gonna do a lightning round here. Okay, so go right ahead. Thank you, Ed and Paul, thanks a lot. In the early 70s, I attended a World Affairs Council uh, lecture that was been given by James Aiken, who had been Saudi Arabian, uh, American ambassador to Saudi Arabia. And he had either he resigned or he was fired because he accused, he said that Kissinger was amoral because of what he did to the Kurds. After he convinced them to revolt against Saddam Hussein, when, some, when uh, Iraq was having problems with Iran, and once they revolted, once Iraq got together again with Iran, then he deserted the Kurds. And because of that, Ambassador Aiken pulled out. Then another book I read today that later on, he came, they asked him to help them out in the case of Iraq. They asked uh, uh, Ambassador Aiken to help. Now, the whole point is, with that kind of uh, thing, of course, that's nothing for the Kurds. He also got double-crossed by Trump after after the ISIS was, they lost more than 12,000 people fighting ISIS, and only four Americans died in that thing. But here again, Trump turned around and left the Kurds in the lurch again. Okay, thank you. Yep, yeah, so, so um, two, two points here, I'd say. First of all, I think I can, I don't know, whether he mentioned this, but the problem Kissinger had at that point was that the Shah made a deal with, with Saddam Hussein uh, behind the backs of the United States. And so Kissinger, I don't think, had a lot of choice about uh, what to do in, the, in those circumstances. But um, he's often charged with being amoral um, because Kissinger... Uh, as I explained, what mattered to him was order and stability. And uh, his judgment, I think, was that that was the ultimate morality because order and stability would do a better job of preserving lives than the alternative of trying to change the world. And uh, we can see consequences of our own actions in the Middle East uh, over the years, and that, that it has a certain point. But from his point of view, morality didn't enter into it. It was a struggle for power between states. And in his view, it was the hierarchy of states that mattered. It was the big powers, the superpowers, the great powers, that were the ones that would maintain the order. And smaller powers, let alone non-state actors like the Kurds, had no place in this order 
that he was seeking to establish. They could not disrupt the order. They were in effect pawns in, in the system. And uh, so for instance, the Palestinians from Kissinger's point of view, they didn't have a state. They were a terrorist organization involved in killing American diplomats in Sudan and trying to overthrow King of Jordan and, and destroy Israel. And so from his point of view, he had the CIA talk to them to try to keep them quiet, but he had no feeling that they, their needs uh, required accommodation. Um, it, you know, that is, that is the way he approached the world. Um, and, and, you know, say the order that he sought to create in the Middle East did a lot to preserve um, life and, and uh, avoid war. Um, and so, you know, he deserves credit for that. But on the other hand, yeah, he was prepared to sacrifice the interests of smaller states and non-state actors uh, for the sake of the order that he was trying to create. Great, thank you. Okay, so a very last question. Oh, all right, well, I guess it sounds like, <laughs> okay, uh, in, in just a lightning question, this may be on many people's minds, so that's why I'm picking it up. Um, you know, yes, yes, no, maybe. Uh, could you comment on the potential, you comment on the potential of an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement given the, uh, the Abraham Accords, the agreements between uh, Bahrain, uh, UAE, and Israel? You know, sure. It's <laughs> <laughs> an easy one. <laughs> okay, look, first of all, the Abraham Accords. This is a normalization of, of relations between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco and to some extent Sudan. Um, and and uh, the first point to make about that from a Kissingerian perspective is that it happened on his timetable. That, you know, it took 40 years for them to finally come around to accepting Israel and normalizing relations with Israel. And what did the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi say in justifying the decision to normalize with Israel? We are tired of the conflict. So this, this notion of exhaustion eventually leading to, to resolution um, was vindicated. But uh, at the same time, the, the uh, Abraham Accords uh, had the effect of sidelining the Palestinians because up until that point, all of the Arab states save Egypt and Jordan that had already made their peace agreements with Israel, all the other Arab states said, yes, we will normalize with Israel, we will recognize Israel, we'll make peace with Israel, but only after Israel resolves the Palestinian problem with an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, living alongside Israel in peace. That was the Arab peace initiative. Now these Arab countries come forward without any Palestinian state of peace between Israel and the Palestinians and, and, and normalized relations. So that, on the face of it, undermined Palestinian um, aspirations to achieve their, their objectives of a Palestinian state. Um, but that's not the end of the story um, because, uh, interestingly, now, as the effort to widen the circle of Arab states that normalize relations with Israel takes place, that effort is actually produced a surprise that was unexpected. It usually happens in the Middle East. It's Egypt and Jordan that have walked through the door. Anybody was looking for Saudi Arabia, but Egypt and Jordan already had made peace, but they had maintained cold peace with Israel, out of the regimes, out of concern for the public opinion, which wanted to see the settlement of the Palestinian problem, or at least they thought so, they kept Israel at a distance. Now these uh, Emiratis, Bahrainis, Moroccans come in, and they're warm, having warm peace with Israel, gaining the benefits of uh, economic benefits of trading with Israel and Israel's high tech, et cetera, et cetera. And the Arabs, the Egyptians and the Jordanians 
see that they want a piece of this action too. And now they've got the cover, political cover, for doing it because these Arab countries have gone ahead and made peace with Israel too. The advantage of having Egypt and Jordan in the Abraham Accords process is that they have special relationships with, for Egypt with Gaza and for Jordan with the West Bank. And as they come in, they are also using their influence in Gaza and West Bank and Jerusalem to stabilize the situation and to try to move it forward. They bring the Palestinian issue into the tent, as it were. And this is important because if Saudi Arabia is to join, and Saudi Arabia is like the crown jewel of the normalization process, as the leader of the Muslim world and the custodian of the mosques of Mecca and Medina, the Saudis are not going to enter the process unless there is progress on the Palestinian issue. And Egypt and Jordan can help Israel make progress on the Palestinian issue that can then bring the Saudis in. So I think that is the way that eventually the Abraham Accords will actually serve the cause of peace between Israel and Palestine. Step by step, to quote a master yeah. of the game. Uh, all right, well, um, we have really come right up against uh, the end of our time on Zoom. Um, please join me in thanking Ambassador Martin Inder. <laughs> <laughs>